Today we're here to see Umar Rashid at his studio in Lincoln Heights. Uh, Umar is a fabulous artist, a great supporter of VPAM, uh, and also he had a show at VPAM in 2019. So we're gonna go talk to him right now. Hey, hey. Steve, what's going Umar, on? Umar, how you doing? I'm good, good man. To see you. Yeah, good to yeah, see you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you for yeah. having me over here. Always, always, man. And it's nice to see new things happening. You, yeah. You know, we've got a bunch of vinyl, we have a DJ set up. Is, is this yours? Or? No, it's my uh, studio mates. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, but it's new. I mean, sometimes there's music here. Let me just take you through some of this, this new stuff that I'm working on. I got a bunch of campuses that I prepped that I got to finish. And then uh, I've been working on these drawings. Uh, these drawings got to gotta get out of here pretty quickly. Uh, so right now I'm back to the California narrative. This is also looks kind of murdery, but uh, you know, this is, this is the wet room. So this is the room that I can, you know, really get loose on these backgrounds with. I'm here every day doing this, uh, doing the research. But for this particular time, um, the research was already done because after I did Made in LA, I didn't have, um, I'm basically just continuing a narrative. So I just had to come up with some, some extra things. And this is uh, some of the newer work also um, that I'm working on. It takes a lot of time, but uh, ultimately, you know, it's worth it because I'm telling this story about Los Angeles, about uh, the indigenous, Lots of things, you know. Um, even there was narrative about uh, Chinese junk that I was trying to incorporate into this narrative, but it, it was just exploded. So I'm just going to do that later. I think I have a show next year in San Francisco. So I think I'm going to talk about, you know, the confluence of all these these people because we, we like to think of history um, from an entirely, well, not we, but most people in this country like to think about history from an entirely European, Eurocentric perspective. So, you know, just doing my best. <laughs> so tell me about these new paintings uh, and what's what's going on with them. Does it fit into the time period? Is this also still about California and Los Angeles? No, this isn't. This is this is uh, the Solo Cup series I do. Like so, every once in a while, like uh, I'll just throw like a uh, non sequitur into the work. Like uh, so, uh, the first thing that I ever did was the Colonial Basketball series, and then you know a slew of sports, and then um, now this is the. Uh, solo cup series, you know, the red cup series and how ubiquitous they are. And so I was just like, oh man, I'm just going to put, you know, people on horses and solo cups. And then it's also influenced by uh, Kanye West video that he did with Kim Kardashian back in the day. So it's kind of, it's an air of humor, but I've really gotten really comfortable with it. You know, it's not, you know, you got to come up with something and, and it's light, you know, because a lot of, you know, dealing with colonialism, you know, it's a lot of death, a lot of tragedy. And so this is probably some of the, you know, the, the work that has the most levity um, to it. Tell me more about how Solo Cups ended up uh, in here. And, you know, I, and I just, you know, we've all held them, you know, over a keg, most likely. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so what is, what is up with the Solo Cups? It's just, well, it's iconic. It's, it's red, you know, it's bold. Um, and they're incredibly ubiquitous, you know, from the rich to the poor, like all strata of society uses these red cups. So, you know, I started seeing them a lot and I was like, oh man, they should be holding solo cups. And then, you know, it's like a St. Bernard with a solo cup instead of a barrel of whiskey, you know, like, you know, just shit like that, man. Like, cause I get, I, I really, sometimes I can't, I, I can't do it. You know, I can't, I get so overwhelmed. Um, I remember I did a show back in 2011 in Cape Town, South Africa, and they sent me all this uh, literature, this material to peruse, and I was reading this material and it just literally made me cry. And so ever since then, I had to learn like, wow, this is gonna, you know, going forward, you know, I'm gonna, you know, delve deeper into the historical narrative, the colonial narrative, and it's not gonna be uh, always rosy so I had to figure out a way you know kind of do some self-care uh, for myself um, to like make you know make things you know again like give it a little bit more levity um, you know so not everything is like all doom and gloom and uh, change it around and, and you know and, and going forward is kind of the reason why you know when when I had my show at, at VPAM um, that was an amazing time because that was one of the first times that I think people in Los Angeles got a chance to see my whole, you know, my oeuvre, uh, like the, all the things, you know, that I made all in one place. 
So that was really interesting. And the fact that it was in the location where it is in, you know, East Los Angeles where I've, you know, called home for the past 20 years. Um, I've actually lived here longer than I ever lived in Chicago, <laughs> which is funny. So now, <laughs> is LA now your home? Oh. It is my home. I mean, but you know, Chicago's always going to be my home because of the hot dogs and the pizza <laughs> that people call casserole. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you will die. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, LA, yeah, LA's, LA's my home. And, um, you know, again, like, you know, going there and even talking to Elac um, once, uh, just, you know, just seeing, you know, talking to my audience, talking to the audience that I want to this work to go to. It's not that I mean, I'm like, oh, because you're this, you can't, you know, you wouldn't understand it, but it's, you know, it's kind of like a FUBU situation. It's like for us, by us, like we're, we're making this work. And so I also think that at least if they, they can't buy it, at least they can see it, <laughs> you know? So um, that, that means the world, that means the world to me. Um, so I'm really excited, uh, you know, happy to be uh, donating a piece um, for the gala. Well, uh, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, you know, the Vincent Price Art Museum uh, did a show with you. Yes. Uh, and you've been extremely supportive mm -hmm. of the Vincent Price Art Museum, mm -hmm. uh, but also other organizations and arts institutions uh, around uh, the LA area. Right. Um, my question to you is, like, you know, what compels you to support uh, uh, institutions like VPAM and other um, uh, And where does that generosity come from? Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I just, I. I feel like, um, you know, I had this, uh, this old African American studies teacher told me, African studies teacher told me in high school, like, you're nowhere if you don't bring people along with you. So if I'm not engaging with my community on um, a, a adequate level or above average level, I don't really feel like I'm contributing anything and it all feels self-serving and performative and selfish and, and I, I'm just, that's just not who I am on the inside. So uh, when it comes to VPAM again, given this is my adopted um, home, it's nice to have, I don't have to drive halfway across town to go see good art. You know, it's right there, like literally like, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from here, maybe 10 on a good traffic day. <laughs> so yeah, you know, and then the people and, and the people that are shown are also, you know, just like, yeah, it's just a, a rich, you know, a rich cultural tapestry there and a, a real treasure um, for this um, for this part of town. And, um, you know, because everybody's now making all their mega museums, like, you know, there's so many private museums. And not that I begrudge them for doing that. I, you know, I think that's fine. You can do whatever you want to with your money as long as it, you know, it's, it serves the community in some way. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Like, uh, and I'm just going to keep on trucking. <laughs> so you, um, you came to Los Angeles in 2000. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how I met you. Um, but I, 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 I think uh, Firecracker. So Firecracker is a club, yeah. a hip-hop club yeah. in Chinatown that yeah. lasted from, like, I think, mid-90s to the mid-2000s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it was through Firecracker. And yeah. so there was a creative community, a creative mm -hmm. hip-hop community. Yep. Uh, you are also into music. Yeah. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, you know, how you weave in uh, music or emceeing into your artistic practice. Um, well, you know, it's actually kind of it's kind of separate uh, as you know, like I don't do a lot of performances anymore uh, because it requires copious amounts of alcohol. Um, so I had to scale that back after my children were born. Uh, I was like, "Where's Daddy? Like there he is on the news, running from a helicopter to no avail." Oh, leg tackle. Um, so. Um, I, um, uh, usually in the titling, in the titling of most shows, I use something from the hip hop era. Uh, I used to use mostly like golden age, golden era hip hop, like from the um, late 80s, early 90s. But now it's, you know, to be more inclusive with the millennials and the generation Z's and Y's and all those people, you know, I incorporate stuff that, that you know, terminology that they, they'll understand. And that's what they, you know, History is a living thing, you know, and so you have to. Um, another thing that I do that I, that I don't see a whole lot of is I, you know, I just adapt. You know, adaptability is is a big major component of the work. But 
but so then is complicity. But anyway, we'll talk about that <laughs> later. But you know, adaptability. Uh, I think that you know, uh, you know, I'm not. I don't want to be like that. You know, like you darn kids. You know, like you know, hey, you know, this is happening. This is the world that I live in, and you know, I'm not going to try to hang out with a bunch of teenagers or try to skateboard or do an ollie, you know, and break my fucking neck. But I, you know, I, I hear them, I see them, so I incorporate everything. But you know, the hip hop. Um, you know, I still rap. I still do. I put out, uh, you know, like a musical project each year. Um, there's a bunch of that stuff on Spotify, uh, <laughs> Apple Music. Plug. Um, so the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, I just, I just do what I, you know, if I like it, then I do it. If I don't like it, I don't do it. If it makes me feel uncomfortable, if it's for a lot of money, I'll do it. So tell me about when you when you did come to LA. In two, oh. <laughs> when you, when you did come to LA in two thousand, mm -hmm. um, what what brought you out here? What was what Certain was in it? Sand. I grew up in the city. Grew up in the city of Chicago, which was brick and steel, and you know I had a choice. Actually, you know that's bullshit. I did have a choice. It was New York, but again, brick and steel city. Didn't really want to live there. And the second choice was San Francisco. But San Francisco, even in at 99, was exorbitantly expensive. So um, LA just seemed like, you know, what's the next place that I can go to? My wife is Japanese, and she wanted to go back to Japan. She wanted to work for some major graphic design company in uh, Tokyo. And I was like, hey, let's give America one last chance. Let's go to the West Coast. Let's go to finishing school and see what we can do. And um, so we ended up here, and I was supposed to give this place three years, but in three years again, I you know I found like this you know this really cool, um, you know, I found the melting pot that is that doesn't really exist in America. I found it here at places like Firecracker and Sound Lessons and you know, just going around the cities at Ghetto Gloss and, you know, uh, going to spots on Abbey Kinney and, and Silver Lake, you know, I found that melting pot where all this, all these different uh, paths intersected. Um, and it was, it was really cool, the Merck Park, you know, going down there, Juju and all that, you know, there was just so much. Um, so I didn't really feel that I had to hightail it out of here as fast as I thought that I did. Um, because I actually didn't even come here to paint. I came here uh, as a photographer. I, was, I studied film and photography and I ended up painting, uh, learning how to paint, self-taught painter and learning from other painters and I, you know, you know, so I just started painting around 2003. But I'd always, I had painted before, but it, you know, it, I was still doing more things with uh, photography. So um, now that I got, you know, uh, I've been here, I found uh, pretty much what I wanted and I, and I just stayed. Or another narrative is just too broke to move uh, or too lazy or just all the ambition <coughs> in me just died. But you know, that's the depressing part. So I'll just, you know. Well, it could be all of those, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, the LA art scene is, a, is can be a very hard nut to crack. Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, almost 20 years later, yeah. you seem to have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you first came here, what were some of the challenges as an artist when you started to paint? Uh, mm. How did you How did you break into the LA art scene? Who were you hanging out with? Um, everybody. Like I was literally in the gutter. You know, I would paint. I would do music. I made T-shirts. I did everything. I did. You know, I did everything imaginable. I was never a rent boy in West Hollywood, on paper. But you know. <laughs> A lot of things I did. I did pretty much everything, yeah. and I and I moved through the strata of the city with relative ease because at that time, you know, I think people were still on the same drugs that they were on during the rave era. So it was almost <laughs> like, yeah, you can get AIDS really horribly and herpes and all that stuff. So the free love was out, but drugs are plentiful, and it was weird. <laughs> it was a very weird, easily <clears throat> navigable place. Yeah. And L.A. was still, well, at least this area, um, East Los Angeles was still relatively affordable, you know, and now it's just like, phew, it's out of there. But, um, yeah, I think, but the art world, back to the uh, art world question, um, making it in the art world, um, that's, 
you know, that's really not up to anybody. It's kind of, uh, it's almost like you get like cherry picked. Unless you go to Yale or places where it's like the art school to art stardom pipeline, which happens a lot. And it's not that those people are not without merit, but I just think, you know, they're, you know, it's, 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 any, it's like any kind of business, any kind of commodities trade, you're just, you know, trading commodities um, on a market. And I am, I have always been unwilling to compromise my, or, um, Integrity is very important to me. So, um, you know, I can make these solo cup paintings forever, but it, you know, I have to, you know, go back into, you know, what I really want to do, and that's to tell this narrative of history where this all-inclusive narrative, narrative of history where, you know, we we all can see ourselves. Because I think seeing yourself is the first step to self-realization, self-actualization, and then uh, reclaiming uh, the power that you know, is, seems to, you know, the, the power that it, it feels that most people don't have. Well, they said they don't because they don't even know themselves. They don't know their history, you know. Uh, and, and I really don't, you know, stray too much from the uh, historical narrative, but, you know, a lot of people, they just don't, um, they don't care. You know, they, you know, and that's why, um, you know, what we see right now is a very reactionary movement, you know, people get upset, go out, protest, smash some windows, carry some signs, and think that's going to change anything, but it won't, because it's reactionary. Anything that's not proactive, can already, can, you, you've already provided the basis for the counter. <laughs> so you have to think like, you know, like guerrilla warfare, you have to think about, you change your tactics. <laughs> if you want to defeat this enemy, you can't use tactics that they've been using for 50 years or 100 years. You have to change your tactics all the time. The whole idea about being proactive, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, is, uh, that is woven into your, your work, too, of creating these alternative narratives, yeah. right? So most of the characters, but, you know, again, I represent everybody. I represent heroes, cowards, gamblers, uh, good people, bad people. Because it, 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 I always tell my children, there's no such thing as good or bad. Like, life is, is, is chaos, you know? We just, you just find the, the, the lulls and the storms, you know? Like, it's all crazy. You know, you, you can't make sense out of this, and people try, but, you know, again, that's another thing in, in reading the, and these, you read these texts and you just see, like, you, there's no rhyme or reason to this. So tell me, um, <clears throat> you know, you've, you've discussed some of these, the drawings, the mm -hmm. paintings, but, uh, you know, I, I do want to say that you have a pretty big show coming up at Blum and Poe. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, mm -hmm. A lot of the work that you're doing currently is leading up to that. Yeah. Um, what, you know, is this a departure? Is, are you using? You're still using the same time period, right? Yeah, yeah. And so well, tell me more about what you're working on. So the Bloom and Poe show, not to let the whole cat out of the bag, is basically uh, it's a it's a uh, parallel narrative to the work that I put up at the Hammer, which was a parallel nar narrative to the work that I did uh, here in LA in 2016, and nobody came out to see. Uh, and then another show that I did in uh, San Francisco that was was pretty nice. But it talks about, um, it's called uh, On Guard, On God. And it, and it talks about um, what happens, again, what, when you don't see things through. So, you know, when you, when you gain everything, like, uh, so it's about the rebel factions and the indigenous people finally getting the Spanish out of here. And then, but, you know, you invite these other people to come and you fight alongside these people and they're like, oh, well, this is beautiful. I think I'll stay. So it's like people are good at fomenting rebellion and dissent, but no one, there's no one any, there to pick up the pieces. And the people who usually pick up the pieces are usually the worst people. So look at any revolution in all of history, even the Servile Revolution from in Rome to the French Revolution to the Mexican Revolution. Uh, uh, you look at all these different revolutions, all the revolutions in in Africa. You know the post, you know the independence uh, movements, uh, even Haiti to a, to a certain extent. Um, people, the governance of the country becomes um, what is it a. Uh, absorbed by, you know, business types. So the spirit of the revolution, you think everybody's going to have bread, you know, the Russian revolution, same thing. You know, and, and all revolutions always end up with a dictator. 
So it's all like, you know, everything is connected. This whole world is 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 one jumbling magma filled ball full of chaos. Yeah. So I just try to make a little bit of sense out of very few things. I don't try to hit anybody over the head with it because I feel that is entirely unnecessary. But this is what makes me happy and I make it look good. Boom. Uh, Umar, I, I love this. We could talk for hours uh, in the studio. Uh, you know, this is this is amazing for me to see the new work, uh, mm -hmm. having to, known you since the early two thousands. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we, we do have you, you do have the show coming up with Blum and Poe. But uh, yeah. you know, before we wrap this up, what mm -hmm. what are your projects after that? Okay, so uh, the Blum and Poe show opens on the sixth of November. I'm opening along Sonia Gomez, a really fantastic uh, Brazilian artist. Uh, I think she's from Sao Paulo, and then um, I after that I go to New York, uh, where I do a show uh, where I reconstructed the the the, the Warriors, the film The Warriors, and so oh. I'm doing that. And then, well, I'm doing part one, The Death of Cyrus, because I, I realize I'm gonna have to cut it up. And then uh, then I go to Miami for Art Basel. I finally got in Art Basel this year after. 15 or so years. Congrats. So yeah, I'm going to Miami. I'm gonna jump in that cool water and lay on the beach and drink some pina coladas and some have some mimosas like for all of the day. And then um, eat some media noches and uh, have, a, have a really great time. And uh, then I'll be back, then I'll be back here to celebrate Christmas with my lovely and difficult family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again, it, it's been a pleasure. You too, brother. Thank you.